Hi everyone and welcome to another lunchtime learning session. My name is Kath and I'm the Education and Outreach Manager for Goodheart Animal Sanctuaries. Today we're going to be exploring artificial selection in agriculture. So this is a term that you may have heard of but may not be too familiar what it actually means. So we're going to explore some real world, real world examples today and just get to know the term a little bit better and understand its importance. Okay then, so let's make a start. What is artificial selection? Well, artificial selection is also known as selective breeding. This is a process which has been happening for thousands of years. Before we can fully understand what artificial selection actually is, we need to take a closer look at DNA. Now, DNA is something that I'm sure many of you are really familiar with, but what actually is DNA and how does this all tie in together to artificial selection? Well, DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. That's a great one there to hold up your sleeve if you ever go to a pub quiz and they ask you what that one means. Um, and this is actually what DNA looks like. So if we zoom in over here, we'll have a look at this image, which I'm sure you're all very familiar with. This is known as a double helix. And that basically means that it is a ladder-like structure, which has been twisted to form a spiral. Now, on the outer edges of this double helix, you can see that we've got a sugar phosphate back, uh, backbone, and this provides the structural integrity of the DNA, makes sure it keeps its shape and stays all together. Now, the really important part of DNA is found here in the centre, and they're known as the base pairs. We have adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. Adenine always bonds with thymine, and guanine always bonds with cytosine. So DNA is made up of base pair nucleotides, that's these guys, the A, T, C, and G, and they're also made up of that phosphate backbone. DNA is really, really important and forms the building blocks of all life on Earth. So every bit of plant matter, every bit of animal matter that you are familiar with, even yourself, you're made up of DNA. And all of our DNA is actually really, really similar. And what scientists have started to do now is map out people's DNA and see um, if they can select certain genes to use for different purposes. How do DNA and genes uh, relate to each other? So I think these two terms are quite easily confused. A lot of people might use them interchangeably, but DNA and genes are actually um, quite distinct things. So if we have a look over on the left hand side here, we've got a really long strip of DNA and this actually encompasses two different genes. So here we can see that the first gene ends about halfway down this strand and it's made up of these base pairs here. Now it's really important to notice the sequence of nucleotide base pairs here. So we can see at the top we've got CG followed by an AT another GC, TA, et cetera, et cetera. This sequence of base pairs is what differentiates the different genes. So that specific order of letters dictates what genes are expressed. So I've just highlighted that here. The specific pattern of A, T, C, and G within the DNA strands dictate which genes are expressed in the organism. So a certain sequence, say you had C, A, G, T, that could equate to a brown hair color being expressed further down the line. If you were to change that sequence to say CCAG, that could give you a blonde color. So as you vary those letters, you also vary the physical um, characteristics which are expressed further down the line. So bear this in mind, what do you think would happen if you changed just a single letter in this sequence? I gave you an example there of brown hair and blonde hair, but remember these genes apply to absolutely everything in the natural world. So even if you were just to change a single letter, think about all of the consequences that that could have on the organism and species as a whole. Now I know this is getting very scientific, but bear with me because it's important to know how all of these aspects tie in together for us to gain a bigger picture. So here, we started off by looking at our DNA sequence, our sequence of letters. This then ties in together to produce specific genes. So you could have a gene for hair color, eye color, skin color, height, um, 
you can also have genes which predispose you to certain diseases. Um, this is all encompassed here in the gene section. These genes are then tightly rolled up into something called um, histones, which are then brought together into um, these X-shaped structures called chromosomes, which are found in the nucleus of our cells. And that's in every single cell in the body, apart from our reproductive cells, which only have half the number of chromosomes, which we'll come on to in a second. So to fully understand artificial selection, we actually need to break this down and have a look at sexual reproduction as a whole. So when organisms reproduce naturally through sexual reproduction, the father's sperm fuses with the mother's egg to produce a fertilized embryo, which contains both the mother and the father's genetic material. Generally, sexual reproduction is consensual and based on mutual attraction. Partners look for attributes that will produce the fittest offspring. This all links back to Darwin's theory of natural selection, which I'm sure you're all very familiar with. Um, and it's also known as survival of the fittest. So every organism that is able to reproduce sexually will be looking to find a partner um, which will produce the fittest offspring. But what does that actually mean? Well, here's a really good example of natural selection. Here we have a crow or a raven which has a specific interest in eating green beetles. So you can see here, the entire population of beetles of the same species um, is actually made up of two different colors. We've got the green ones and we've got the orange ones. Um, An environmental pressure, such as the crow choosing to eat only green beetles means that over time, there are fewer and fewer green beetles available. So you can see the number of brown beetles is increasing because they're not being eaten. So that brown coloration trait is becoming more common within that population. And actually these are the fittest individuals because they are surviving. Green beetles have now been fully selected against and the brown beetles have flourished. So you can see how over time, the brown beetles have been able to reproduce um, with a lot more success because their offspring, which are likely to be brown, are less likely to be eaten. And so that specific color, that specific trait is more likely to be passed down into their offspring. So here we have Charles Darwin, who most famously said, it is not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent, but the one most responsive to change. And this is actually really important and genetics play a massive role in a species ability to respond to change. So the greater a species population, the more number of individuals within a single species, the greater their genetic diversity. That means they have a greater variety of combinations of genes within the entire species population. The more variety in their genetic material, the more able that species is to overcome environmental change. So if you imagine it um, as a very large species population, each individual within the population will have a slightly different sequence of letters uh, or DNA sequence, which means that they have great genetic diversity. Um, so if something catastrophic were to happen or great environmental change, at least a few of those individuals within the species will have the correct genes to be able to respond to that pressure and actually survive. So although some individuals may not survive, the species as a whole will. And that's really important. So basically genetic diversity is the same as species fitness. It's really important to maintain genetic diversity when you're breeding organisms together. So where does artificial selection come into all of this? Well, rather than allowing a species, and that could be a plant or an animal to reproduce naturally, Artificial selection occurs when humans select the breeding pairs based on their genetics. So I've got an example here of modern day corn. So I'm sure you're all very familiar with um, the maize that we see on the right hand side here. This is a modern corn on the cob and you can see that there's a very high number of fruit on that cob. Um, and it actually produces a much higher yield than its ancestral 
um, organism. So over on the left hand side, you can see the ancient corn. This is the wild variety, what corn would have looked like around 4000 years ago. And you can see it's got a much lower yield. That means it produces much lower amounts of fruit on the same plant. And literally over thousands of years, humans have selected um, the plants which produce the most or the highest yield of fruits and bred them together in the hopes that their offspring um, are also high yield and so on and so on um, until we arrive at this modern day corn on the right hand side. So this is just a breakdown of the whole process. So again, on the left hand side over here, you can see the wild variety of corn. We've got the male and the female plant. When you breed them together, you are looking for desired traits. Um, so first, the desired characteristics of a mixed population are chosen to breed. So here we're looking for um, very high yield plants. So that's the trait, the desired characteristic that we're looking to um, reproduce. Then once you've um, bred your first generation, you then select those offspring which exhibit the desired traits and you breed them together in the hopes that with each um, subsequent generation, those traits become more and more pronounced. And over time, over hundreds or even thousands of years, you go from this plant to this plant over here, which I think you'll agree looks extremely different to its ancient uh, ancestor. So here we're going to have a little look at dogs as another example. So all dogs on earth came from one common ancestor, which was a species of wolf. So why is it that today we have many different breeds of dog, such as those who are as small as a chihuahua and those who are as large as a Great Dane. These animals are still the same species and yet they look drastically different to each other. So why has that happened and why do we choose to do that to our animals? What is the benefit for us? Well, desired traits can be selected for, for usefulness or just for preferences and appearance. Dogs were artificially selected for their gentle nature and suitability as companion animals. They were also used for work purposes, for herding animals um, and progressing the agricultural movement at the time. Let's take a look now at artificial selection in farmed animals. So on the left here, you can see an image of a wild boar. And I want you to notice um, how large this animal is, how well muscled, Look at his colouring. Um, it's very natural, very good camouflage for blending into a deciduous forest background. Um, also check out his tusks. You can see that they are quite a prominent um, feature of this animal. Now let's compare that to our modern day pig on the right hand side here. Just take a moment now to reflect on the differences of these two animals. Modern day pigs um, were derived from the wild boar on the left hand side. But over thousands of years, humans have artificially selected for certain desirable traits. And as we go through these different examples, I want you to have a think about what those traits might be. So why have we gone from this wild boar on the left hand side to this stereotypical pig on the right hand side that you can see there? Bear with me on that one and we'll come back to it in a second. Let's have a look at another example. On the left hand side, you can see an animal called an oryx. Now this animal is now extinct. Um, we don't have it on planet earth, but as I'm sure you can guess, this is the ancestor of our modern day cow. Now again, I just want you to take note of the very obvious differences in, in physical appearance here. So the oryx obviously has incredibly large horns. You can see he's very well muscled uh, on his neck area. Um, and also differences in coloring there. Again, the oryx is very well camouflaged against his background. Um, very different in appearance to the Frisian on the right hand side. Why has this happened? Have a little think about that for me and we will come back to it. Just having a look at another example here then. On the left, we've got a picture of a wild sheep species. And on the right hand side, you can see it's modern day um, equivalent. So just take, you know, another minute here just to reflect on the differences between these two animals. Why have we derived um, our modern day sheep from its wild ancestor? 
why have we artificially selected for certain traits to come through? And again, we've got another example here of a wild species of chicken, um, which originated in Indonesia. Let's compare this to the modern day broiler chicken, which is reared for meat in industry. Take a look at these two images. What do you notice? What are the differences? Think about their size, think about their coloring, think about their limbs, think about their weight. What are the differences between these two animals and how have humans interfered um, and artificially selected for change? What have they done? Well, let's take a look at each example in a bit more detail. Starting with a pig. We have selected for certain desired traits. Now, at the time, we would have done this to increase the amount of food that we could produce to support our ever-growing populations and our increasing demand for meat. So traits that we'll be looking for to increase that yield, fast growth rate. You really want your animals to grow quickly so that ultimately you can slaughter them at an earlier age um, and produce more generations of animals um, to produce more meat. You also want them to have a reasonably friendly nature. So if we just compare this back to the wild boar, um, imagine a wild boar in a farming situation. And I think you'll agree that is an undesirable trait. So pigs that were um, potentially more friendly will have been bred together um, in the hope that their offspring will also be friendly um, and more malleable ultimately. We also select for different um, presence of different types of meat. So you may want a slightly fatter pig, you may want a slightly leaner cut of meat. You also want a very high birth rate. So you want animals that come into season quickly, are able to reproduce quickly and go back into season again after giving birth very, very quickly. And of course, pigs are renowned for having incredibly large litter sizes as well. So a mother pig could have, you know, 12 or 13 piglets per litter, which again increases that yield. Let's take a look at a dairy cow now. Um, this is a Frisian Holstein. How does that differ to the wild oryx that we saw earlier? Well, again, they've got a very fast growth rate. They have a friendly nature. You can select for fatter or leaner cuts of meat as you desire. These have a very high milk production, as you can see by her enlarged udders there. There's a very large surface area for the production of leather. And these animals can be trained to pull carts or plows, which at the time was an important progression um, for agriculture as a whole. Sheep, so what's happened to sheep over time? What have, art what have humans artificial, artificially selected for? Well, again, fast growth rate, friendly nature, fatter or leaner meat as you desire. Here we have a very high wool production. So obviously in years gone by, we were incredibly reliant on a sheep for their wool in order to produce our clothing. We also feed off their milk. And again, um, our sheep are having higher and higher birth rates. So modern day ewes now are, rather than just having one baby as they typically would in the wild, are having two or even three, or even sometimes four lambs um, in one birth. So that's a big change there as well. And then having another look at our broiler chicken, which was very, very different to its ancestor. Extremely fast growth rate. And we will be looking at this in slightly more detail in a bit. Again, friendly nature. So you'll notice the talons, you know, aren't as pronounced as they are in the wild species. A incredibly high yield of meat. So you can just see there the very large breasts, the very large legs. Um, all designed for human consumption. And again, high birth rates. So what are the benefits of artificial selection? Why have humans done this? You know, what is the point of doing it? Um, so animals were first domesticated around 10,000 years ago. That's an incredibly long time ago. The domestication of crops and animals meant that humans could actually build larger and more complex civilizations rather than having to travel with the seasons. 
So previously, humans were known as hunter-gatherers. They were having to move around the planet um, in order to find certain vegetables and meat as they were migrating across the world as well. Humans would follow them. Now, with the evolution of agriculture, they were able to stay in one place. And that meant um, humans were able to invest their time in other ventures, such as creativity and trade. Um, and that was all due to the fact that they were able to increase their yields um, from settling down and growing their own food rather than chasing it. Without artificial selection, technology as we know it would not be the same today. So what is the problem? Well, in the past, artificial selection has been used to increase our production of food in times of need. But now, some may say that we have taken artificial selection too far and that animals may now suffer as a result of selective breeding. Um, I'm going to show you a few case studies now just to demonstrate um, the disadvantages of artificial selection and some examples where people may think it's gone too far. So I'll just give you a little disclaimer here. Some of the images I show you may be slightly upsetting, so please do skip through them if you don't want to see them. So here we've got a picture of a wolf skull uh, and at the bottom there you can see an image of a modern pug skull. Um, and as you can see, the snout of the pug has been extremely shortened. Um, and this actually results in difficulty in breathing in the pug. But humans continue to select for this gene because they believe it is um, an indicator of the breed standard. Now, I believe this is something that breeders are more familiar with nowadays and something that they're not doing as actively as they were in the past. But this is just a really good example of how artificial selection can be taken a step too far sometimes to the detriment of the animal. Okay, so we're going to have a look at another example here, which is the broiler hen. Now, as you can see, the broiler hen has changed dramatically over the past 50, 60 years. So going back to 1957, you can see at a 56 day age, um, the chicken in question here weighed 905 grams. Now compare this to 20 years further down the line, 1978, the chicken of the same species of the same breed at the same age reached a whopping 1,808 grams. Now fast forward to 2005, which, you know, is still 16 years behind us, um, that same chicken at the same age has now reached an incredible weight of 4,202 grams. And we can only assume um, that this weight increase uh, has continued into the modern day. And why have humans done this? Well, it's purely to increase the amount of meat produced by a single bird. Now, this is not done with the chicken's best interest in mind. In fact, um, these increased weights uh, and increased yields actually have very detrimental impacts on the animal's health. So here you can see a typical broiler hen um, in an intensive indoor system. And you can see that the hen is actually having difficulty moving here. Um, this is typical of these broiler hens. Um, their breasts are so large, quite often their legs are splayed. Um, and this makes it incredibly difficult for them to get about and walk around as they normally would, which obviously this is very distressing for us to see. Um, and just this is another prime example of how we are putting a human's wants and needs before the animal's um, best interests. We can also have a look at another example in sheep. So on the left hand side here, you may be familiar with this image. This is quite a famous sheep. Um, he's a Mourinho breed, which is found in Australia. And this fellow was actually lost from his flock. And they believe he was wandering wild for around five to six years. As you can see, his woolly fleece never stopped growing. So in agriculture, we shear a sheep's fleece once or twice a year. And this is to remove that thick woolly fleece um, to help them regulate their temperature in the warmer summer months. We remove their woolly jacket to help cool them down. And most modern sheep breeds are unable to shed their wool in any other way. So they have become reliant on us humans shearing their wool away from them. Some wild, wilder breeds um, are still able to shed their own wool naturally. 
but because we um, over hundreds of years have bred the sheep to produce more and more wool they have become dependent and reliant on us mechanically removing their wool um, and that's because we've just bred them to produce such high yields of wool so here going back to this image going back to this example um, this poor sheep has not been sheared in five or six years and it is fair to suggest that this sheep um, will be overheating immensely. Um, he'll also be carrying around incredible amounts of weight. The, the fleece itself is incredibly heavy, so this will be exhausting for the sheep to move around. Um, and it just goes to show how a once wild animal has now grown entirely dependent on humans for general care. Now, this image on the right uh, may be familiar to you. This is probably quite a common sight across the UK. You may have seen sheep feeding down on their knees before, but have you ever actually wondered why they do that? Well, quite often it's because they're suffering from something called foot rot. So um, sheep are very prone to getting infections in their feet when bacteria can get trapped underneath, underneath the hoof. Um, and when these bacteria get trapped, they breed and they start causing infections, which actually creates a very sore foot for the sheep. And if left untreated, as in this case, the individual will resort to moving around on their knees. Now, obviously, this is really painful and uncomfortable for the sheep, um, and they shouldn't have to go through this at all. And with regular care, um, a sheep is absolutely fine to go around walking on its feet and they won't get infected. But if left and neglected, this is um, what can happen. Um, and this, again, this is because the sheep have become entirely dependent on humans for their care. So how do natural and artificial selection tie in together? Bringing it back to natural selection, artificial selection has some risks associated with it, such as reducing the genetic diversity of a species population. So if you think back to the very start of this lesson when I was talking about Charles Darwin, and we spoke about natural selection and survival of the fittest. So with greater biodiversity, you have a um, greater species fitness. Artificial selection actually is the opposite of that. So rather than promoting genetic diversity, in the past, artificial selection has narrowed the diversity. This leaves some species, such as the banana, very susceptible to genetic disease or climate change. So let's have a look at banana in more detail. For decades, the most exported and therefore most important banana in the world was the Gros Mikel, or also known as the Big Mike. But in the 1950s, it was practically wiped out by a fungus known as Panama disease or banana wilt. Now, across the entire world, there is only one cultivar of banana left, and that is called the Cavendish. Scientists used to think that the Cavendish was resistant to Panama disease, but in 2009, sorry, 19, it was actually discovered that they are also susceptible to this very fungus. So this means in time, we may live in a world without bananas, because when that single cultivar is wiped out due to its um, lack of genetic diversity, that's it there will be no more bananas in the world, which obviously is a very scary thought. Now, let's just wrap this all up. We've had a whistle-stop store of um, genetics in general, artificial selection, natural selection. How does this all tie in together? As technology and our understanding of genetics has progressed, we are less likely to cause defects as a result of artificial selection. Rather than breeding individuals as a whole, scientists are now able to reproduce very specific genes. So they can actually cut out very specific bits of DNA and insert that into another organism without having to reproduce two entire organisms together. This area of science is known as genetic engineering and can be used to help increase resilience in our food crops as the problem of climate change continues to grow. Scientists involved in genetic engineering may have to go through rigorous checks to ensure that they are not doing anything unethical. Scientists hope that genetic engineering may help in the fight against climate change. Artificial selection and genetic engineering remain very contentious issues for animal rights activists. So let's just have a quick recap of everything we've learned so far. Artificial selection was an incredibly important mechanism for human civilization. 
However, it is now up to us to act responsibly and remove the intense breeding pressure placed on animals. These animals are sentient creatures. Um, they are capable of feeling emotion. They're capable of feeling pain. Um, they have individual characters. And this is something that we need to acknowledge and make sure that we treat them in that responsible, respectful manner. So no longer are we heavily, solely reliant on animals to produce our food. Now, as technology has progressed, we know that we're able to rely on plant-based food, um, even to support a massively growing population. We know that actually it's much more efficient to eat a plant-based diet. So this is what we now need to shift our attention to. We must now explore genetic engineering techniques which can improve our food crops without causing animal suffering. And that's it. I really hope you enjoyed this lunchtime learning session and I hope to see you again. If you would like to discuss any of the issues or topics that I've spoken about in this lesson, please do feel free to get in touch. My email is kath at goodheart.org.uk. Thank you very much for listening and I hope to see you soon.